Okay, uh, our third uh, uh, presenter and presentation is uh, from uh, Dr. Um, Kat McNichol, and she's presenting remotely. Oh, there she is. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, I think Kat is presenting from Scotland. Are you, are you are you actually doing a scat search at the moment? Yeah, I'm actually here with Dave. So Dave and I have just I, done I a quick thought swap. So. I wasn't yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. So uh, uh, yeah, so she's she's up in Scotland with a team uh, doing a, a pre, uh, uh, basically a, a survey for uh, presence of pine martins pre translocation later this year down to the Forest of Dean. That's correct, is it? Post translocation, just to Post. check that there's still good numbers. So from the translocation ah, that we did, ah right, yeah, I got it the wrong way around. It's okay. all right. Good. Yeah, and um, Kat, Kat has been managing uh, the uh, reintroduction of pine martins in the Forest of Dean, which has been very successful to date. And I, I think there will be one more translocation this year. No, got that wrong. That's well. us. No, there Damn. were potentially going to be three, but in the end, there's just been two. So that's us. Yeah, I guess it's all, this is all the last the hurrah. Yeah, by COVID. And also, Kat did her uh, PhD research in mid Wales. Uh, during the uh, Pine Martin recovery and translocation in the Mid Wales from 2015 to 2017. I hope I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so anyway, we're looking forward to um, uh, hearing your presentation uh, about translocations in general. And um, so it's over to you, Kat. Oh, here we go. Yes, so today I'm broad, going to give a very broad overview, I guess, of the translocation process that we've been through, um, particularly in the Forest of Dean with Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, but a lot of the lessons that we learned on this project were really taken from the Vincent Wildlife Trust's work in Mid Wales. But I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about the translocation process, but then also the post-release monitoring of this newly established population. So as a brief overview, and Dave Tosh has kind of touched on a lot of these uh, things already today, but pine martins were once widespread across the UK, but that distribution became very much restricted and martins were really only in a stronghold in the north of Scotland by the early 1900s. They have since started naturally recovering throughout Scotland and across the Scottish border into some parts of northern England, but it was, it was concluded that their natural recolonisation of major parts of southern Britain and so England and Wales was very much unlikely. So since 2015, there have been a number of, of pine martin reintroductions in Wales. But during that, that process, the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, which is marked on the map here, um, was also identified as a good release site. Um, and it was thought that as that Welsh, that newly established Welsh population expanded naturally, um, this new Forest of Dean reintroduction, this new population would kind of bolster that expanding population. So we had a really genetically diverse um, and resilient population in the southwest. And modelling actually predicts that the, the, these, this Welsh Martin population will become almost indistinguishable from the Forest of Dean population in the next 10 to 15 years. So that's a, a kind of really positive outcome for, for both of these species reintroductions. The, the area circled on the, on the map in Scotland is really where the majority of the pine martins in the, in the Forest of Dean reintroduction have been trapped from. So following that, that Welsh reintroduction, Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, in collaboration with Forestry England and a huge number of other partners, started Project Pine Martin. And the main aim of that project is really to, to reintroduce Pine Martins to the Forest of Dean and Lower Wye Valley. So this is right on the, the English-Welsh border. This project really comprised a two-year feasibility study, which looked at the ecological and the social feasibility of, of reintroducing Pine Martins into this area, and then a five-year delivery phase of the project. So we're just reaching the end of that third year so we've done two years of releases which which was interrupted by a year of covid um, and a year of volunteer engagement and, and monitoring so the next two years of the project will really be embedding that monitoring and that engagement of local communities um, into into the project well, it was a very whistle-stop tour of pine martin translocations and, and reintroductions all of the martins on this project were wild trapped scottish martins the martins are trapped from the, the belly of the pine martin population in Scotland, so where that population is already very resilient um, and at very good numbers, so it can sustain a number of individuals being taken from that population. We only translocate adult animals and we take as much as we can a 50-50 split of males and females. All of these martins are radio coloured, so they get um, 
it's like horse bridle leather that the collars are made of. And these collars are designed to kind of stretch and wear off after about a year, but it allows us to track um, the Martins for the pretty much the first year of their release to understand where they go, if they remain site loyal, and um, how many of them survive or, or are killed during that process. Um, so once the, trans that once the pine martens are, are radio colored, they're allowed to recover in these tack carry crates, kind of box you would take your cat to the vet in. Uh, all of the animals are microchipped and they all have unique radio frequencies on their collars um, and unique identification numbers. So these animals are then driven from, from our trap site um, or our kind of main base up in Scotland, all the way down to the Forest of Dean, um, which is a kind of drive. It's about 12 hours of your life that you will never get back. Um, but but that, that procedure is very efficient. And really the pine martens go from being wild in a forest in Scotland to within their soft release pen in the Forest of Dean in less than 24 hours. So it's become a very efficient process, which aims to minimize the stress to the animals while they're being translocated. So in this, in this instance, for both of the translocations, we, we translocate up to four animals every four days down to the Forest of Dean. They go into these release pens, which are about three by three by three meters. They're just big, big cubes. And they'll stay in those release pens for about five days. That allows them to kind of calm down, allows their stress hormones to reach a, a normal level. And it allows us to monitor their behavior and their health and the, the, the kind of status of their color, whether they've managed to pull it off during the drive. So for this project, we've translocated 35 Pine Martins over the two, the two years, um, 18 in the first year, 17 in the second year. This is really the setup inside the release pen. So we have trail cameras, which monitor the Martins and they've got a den box up in the, in the background there. They have a table with uh, as much food supplied as they could ever want. And there are eggs hidden around that that pen just to give them a little bit of enrichment. On the, on the final day, the pen door is basically just opened and the animals are allowed to leave when they please. Some of them don't realize the door is open for quite some time, um, but they do all eventually leave the pen. The idea of the soft release is that there is food provided and a den box provided should that animal return to that site um, for a few nights if it can't find food or it can't find den boxes. But all of the marns that we released never came back to that release pen. Um, which, which is great. It suggests that they're, they're fairly capable of coping um, on their own. So the post-release monitoring, it feels like almost that's the hard work done now the Pine Martins are there, but um, in a way for us, that's when the hard work really begins. Um, there are a number of success criteria. If we think about this in a very project management way, um, we, have to, we have to be able to quantify the success or, or not of the project. And um, so we have some main criteria that we want to be able to document. So we want to understand the mortality rates of the animals, um, their dispersal, whether they stay site loyal, whether they move away from the release sites completely, if they establish territories, and then finally, if they're breeding uh, with each other or if they successfully reproduce following the translocation. So the, the main way that we start monitoring the Martins straight after the translocation is through radio tracking. It is highly um, labor intensive, um, but it, it has been fascinating and uh, I guess very interesting to understand you know how this the ecological feasibility study how actually accurate it is it how much do the martins stay where we expect them to stay so for context uh, for those of you that you aren't familiar with the area and um, this main green block in the middle is the, the forest of Dean and um, the river running down almost the center of this map is the Y river it borders England and Wales um, and then this big blue river along the bottom is the Severn so really the Forest of Dean sits in this wedge this triangular wedge which has been very interesting when we start looking at the dispersal of Martins and how much they depend on habitat connectivity or landscape uh, patterns I suppose in in the way that they move so within the main forest we had eight release pens which the Martins were were cycled through individually we used the same release pens in the first year and in the second year of translocation. So all of the Martins were basically released from the exact same place. Um, and what we find is in the first year, so when we released 18 individuals, all of these dots represent locations that we have of Martins that we released. Um, and we find that the majority of animals stay very much site loyal. They don't move hugely far away from their release locations, which is a really positive thing for us. It suggests that the feasibility that showed the, the Forest of Dean had great pine martin habitat, had loads of pine martin food available, and um, that feasibility study was, was correct and is really reflected in the, in the site loyalty of those martins. 
If we then look at the, the second year of releases, again, these dots represent Pine Martin locations, not millions of individuals. And um, what we see really is that the, the Martins aren't using the, the very core habitats they were released in. They've moved out to, to more fringe habitats and they've actually started to cross the Y River, which they didn't do in the first year. So if we overlay those two years, assuming that those territories are fairly stable, what we see is this wonderful patchwork quilt of Pine Martins. And if you divide it up into individuals, you see very much the, the this self-sorting of the Martins into unique territories across this landscape. And we see a really similar pattern in, when, we, when we reintroduce Pine Martins in mid Wales, where the first cohort, the first year group, when, they, when they're released into a Pine Martin empty landscape, they stay very site loyal and form this almost anchoring population, um, which stays very near the release sites. If you then translocate a next, the next group of animals on top of them, they self sort and they form this almost um, concentric ring, this donut shape around that anchoring population. And it's really nice that we've seen that not only in Wales, but in this Forest of Dean reintroduction, it helps us almost predict, you know, if you do do more than one year of releases, where these animals are going to go. So in a way, we don't have to move release sites around, we can put animals in on top of each other, and they will automatically sort themselves out. Now, obviously, not all of the animals read the, the handbook, they didn't all stay in the release site, and some of them do move substantially large distances. Now, we're probably not hugely surprised by this, but I think a lot of people, when they look at Pine Martins, they think, well, these animals, they don't move very far. But some of our animals did move over 60 kilometers away from their release site. In the first year, uh, when there were no Pine Martins present initially, um, a lot of the Martins did stay very site loyal, um, and only a few moved, made these kind of long distance movements away from that core release area. However, as to be expected, when you've got an increased density of martins, um, there are le less territories available and the martins will move further away from that release site to, to find optimal territories where there's potentially reduced competition. So in the second year, we see more animals moving, probably following these rivers like the Y and the Lug up north, and not only north, but down into the to the west into some of the nice woodlands in um, South Wales, and then also round towards the Cotswolds, which is just astonishing. But it does show that this habitat is sometimes more connected than we per possibly think or we can see just based on maps. There are lots of landscape factors that facilitate the movement of species through the landscape. So looking at landscape connectivity and overlaying some of these, these pine martin movements will be really interesting in the future. Obviously, radio tracking is super labor intensive. It's expensive and it's not a long term solution to monitoring martins and that's really looking at martins on an individual level when we want to be monitoring them long term on a, on a population level, because we want to have so many animals that we don't need to look at them on an individual level. So this is where we really, the key is, is starting to use volunteers and the local community to help us with a lot of the monitoring and loads of people have already spoken about some of these methods um, today. So what we've done to try and get a bit of, uh, I guess, community buy-in and make the volunteers feel very, like have a sense of ownership over the project is we've divided the, the main release area up into two by two kilometer squares. And we encourage the volunteers to almost adopt a square or a couple of squares. Each year they survey that square, they put a six week camera trap baited station out in that square. And there'll be den boxes in a large number of these squares for us to monitor. So you start getting that kind of sense of, community it is a sense of community ownership that makes people almost feel more involved and makes the monitoring process much more sustainable on a long-term period and um, so our bread and butter is really camera trapping and this has been key in an area where you know looking for a pine martin is like trying to find a unicorn there are not many of them about i've seen one i think in the last five years so with the volunteers it helps if they can kind of see tangibly what, what they're working on and what they're contributing to. So our camera trap loan scheme where we lend out cameras for six week periods is really helpful for us in understanding which bits of woodland maybe have pine martens in them that we had previously not realized, but also it helps the volunteers kind of see what, what kind of project they're contrib contributing to. Um, with all of the Martins, because they've all been trapped in Scotland and we've been able to get bib shots of them, we have this fantastic bibliography, this collection of bib shots, which allows us to identify individuals. So we can kind of tell from the camera trap footage who's who, even if the animals do or don't have, have collars on. 
um, and it makes a fantastic poster. So I'm, I might try and you know make that widely available. Um, but the, the images are all well and good in principle. Um, so you have this on the left hand side, you have this anesthetized Martin, we've got a, a bib shot. The, the drawing kind of almost caricatures those spots and freckles on the bib. However, when you actually start camera trapping Martins, it can become like a bit of a detective series trying to figure out who's who. So we do employ jigglers, which are, are commonly used um, on our project and I think quite a few other projects, but it's basically a tea strainer filled with some form of lure. We tend to use peanut butter because we're sick of our cars smelling of fish. Um, but anything that makes the pine martin kind of meerkat up and give us a really good image of its bib really helps us to identify which martins are coming to the same bait stations. Um, and if we've got any new individuals that are entering the population either as kits or potentially as some of these new Welsh martins start moving into the area. These strategies are not without their problems and we do have a lot of troublesome badgers and squirrels that will destroy these sites. And also if we want to start moving on to a kind of population level monitoring, looking at individual animals may not actually be necessary. In terms of den boxes and breeding checks, you know, one of the things we really want to establish is are the pine martens giving birth and, you know, expand that, is that new population expanding? So we have about 50 den boxes up in the Forest of Dean and we're trying new methods. And I think actually Johnny's about to speak to this, speak about this later this afternoon. So I won't, I won't spend too much time on it, but we've been looking at ways to, to survey these, these den boxes without being too disruptive and you know, to reduce the amount of time it takes to understand if there's animals in, in den boxes. So these are some images I've taken of captive pine martens in BWT den boxes. So the captive martin is up on the right hand side. Obviously, you can see they're quite well insulated, but this, this picture in the bottom left corner shows a heat signature of a pine martin in a den box. Obviously, if there's a heat signature in a box, it may be a squirrel or some other animal, but if we can use the, the thermal cameras to go, yes, we need to check that box or no, we don't need to check it, it could massively reduce the amount of time it takes us and also allow citizen scientists to survey some of the den boxes for us. Um, but actually, unfortunately, den boxes are great for monitoring pine martin populations, but the Forest of Dean has fantastic natural cavities. It's got a huge, a high percentage of broadleaf in this woodland. And as a result, all of the females that have given birth um, since the first translocation, which has been every year uh, for the last two springs, they've all given birth in natural cavities, which again is great, but really annoying if the cavity is about seven meters up a tree and then three meters into a cavity. So we've been using borescopes, um, which are basically just, they're used for checking air conditioning vents, um, but with little lights to, to feed them in to these uh, cavities to check um, the, the number of kits females have given birth to and what kind of den sites they're using. So most of them are giving birth in yew trees and um, ancient beech trees. Um, but obviously all of this work is licensed, so there are only a few individuals that can do it, which is why the thermal imaging checks and, and kind of um, ways that we can involve the volunteers in checking boxes and den sites is, is much more efficient in terms of time. Another way that we survey, which is a really standard way of surveying for Mar Martins, is scat surveys, which is great if you can train the, the volunteers. We had a year where we had COVID and it was very challenging to run any volunteering sessions. So we've come up with these Martin master classes, um, which are basically just short introductory videos to lots of different topics. So there's one about setting up camera traps for Martins, one about surveying um, for scats, one for checking den sites in a kind of non-invasive way. And this has become a brilliant tool for us at Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust because every time we get new volunteers, they don't need to wait until you know we do like a six monthly volunteer training session. They have access to all of these resources so they can remind themselves how to do a scat survey or how to set up a camera trap. Um, and it means that there's a bit more longevity in that training. So once the, the skill set of the staff goes, these projects still have um, resources to teach volunteers and kind of encourage that continued citizen science within the project. In terms of the future of the project, we really want to make sure, and I think especially with further reintroductions happening in the UK, that there is a comparable methods are used to monitor Martin. So whether that is that we sync up the, the surveys that we do in the Forest of Dean with those, those done in, in Ireland or in Wales with the expansion zone survey, moving to kind of hectad scale on a five year cycle, something that when, when we then go to look at the data, it's really done on such a comparative scale that it makes it much easier for us to document the expansion of these populations and, and using similar methods, it makes that 
much easier. And especially with the uh, Pine Martin reintroductions becoming quite a hot topic, I think it's important that lessons can be learned from not only the, the reintroductions that have happened in Wales, but the reintroduction in the Forest of Dean, um, and they can inform and improve the success of any future reintroductions that happen across the rest of the country. And so that was very much our, our little whistle stop tour of, of Pine Martin translocations. But if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer them. Uh, thank you, Kat. And yeah, quick round of applause. Thank you, Kat. That, that, that's a tremendous uh, presentation there. I, I find it uh, so exciting that Pine Martins are making a recovery in Wales and the border counties of Wales uh, through our help, really. And I think, I, I think I'm speaking for everybody here. And you wouldn't believe how happy I am to see that some of those Martins are moving from the Forest of Dean into Wales. They're obviously very sensible Martins that are able to select habitat, good quality habitat for themselves. And I really like the idea of the uh, uh, poster, the bibliography poster. I, I'd go for a tea towel or a beach towel as well <laughs> if you had them. I'd, I'd definitely buy those. So, um, yeah, okay. Any questions from the live audience here first? Hands up. Ooh, several hands just there. Um, Kat, I, I find it really interesting that despite all the den boxes up, the, the Martins chose natural sites to den in. And, I'm just wondering what is the box lacking or you know have you any insights into that i think it's not that the box is lacking anything it's just that the habitat is so good that the boxes are really designed for areas where there is a lack of natural cavities and um, so they're they're best put up in poor martin habitat so we tend to put them up in in the more kind of uh, commercial uh, conifer stands we don't put them up in the nice beech woodland because they don't need to be there um, so I actually just think it's the boxes were designed for poor Martin habitat and we're not working in poor Martin habitat, but we we put the boxes up to almost um, as an insurance policy, I suppose, so that if the Martins were struggling to find den sites, they use the boxes. So in a way, I see it as a success that they're not using the boxes because it means that we have really chosen great Pine Martin habitat to release them into. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. That, that was great, Kat. Thank you very much. How how did you find Pine Martins that had moved sixty kilometres away from the introduction site? <laughs> so Josie, the the project officer, uh, really enjoys uh, just driving around the countryside aimlessly looking for them. Um, and so yeah, I think we found them when we've been coming on trips back from you know visits up north or visits to London. We've just been like, well, just put the radio tracking equipment on and try and find them. But if you look at the maps, um, you can. We tend to follow the river, the rivers away from the forest, and it gives you a good starting point. Um, because most of them, if, when you look at the woodland they've settled in, it is connected to some of these larger, I guess, riparian zones. So we kind of try to think like pine martens and, and drive all of the linear features. Um, so yeah, it is a bit like a needle in a haystack situation, though. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. We've had a lot of well? yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of questions come in on on um, Zoom, but we are running quite behind, so I'll have to just stick with one and then send the rest to Cat on Zoom. And if you wouldn't mind Cat answering people on Zoom, that would be really yeah. helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we do have a question, which is, um, sorry, just give me a second. Do you know what age approximately the trees you're seeing pine martens breeding in are in the Forest of Dean? What's the age structure? I reckon they're over 80. So they're like really gnarly old trees um, with huge cavities, dropped limbs. I think one of the one of the Martins was in a beech tree that was over 120 years old. So there's a lot of um, a triple SI woodland, um, ancient woodland and, and pause woodland in the Forest of Dean. And they tend to favor some of those larger trees. Yeah. Initially, when they when they first drop the litter, but they have been seen to move to slightly younger trees that are maybe I don't know, 70, but most of them are, I would say, classed as veteran trees. Okay, thank you. I'll pass you on the other questions. I can see Johnny waiting and I'm conscious in our final session, we're going to Germany. Um, so thank you very much. And, and sorry to everyone whose questions I didn't get to put across. Just too interesting, Kat. <laughs> thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Kat.